Chapter 1 of Agriculture for Beginners This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Logan Lorenz, Watoma, Wisconsin. Agriculture for Beginners by Charles William Burkett Chapter 1. The Soil. Section 1. Origin of the Soil. The word soil occurs many times in this little book. In agriculture, this word is used to describe the thin layer of surface earth that, like some great blanket, is tucked around the wrinkled and age-beaten form of our globe. The harder and colder earth under this surface layer is called the subsoil. It should be noted, however, that in waterless and sun-dried regions there seems little difference between the soil and the subsoil. Plants, insects, birds, beasts, men, all alike are fed on what grows in this thin layer of soil. If some wild flood in sudden wrath could sweep into the ocean this earth-wrapping soil, food would soon become as scarce as it was in Samaria when mothers ate their sons. The face of the earth, as we now see it, daintily robed in grass, or uplifting waving acres of corn, or even naked water-scarred, and disfigured by man's neglect, is very different from what it was in its earliest days. How was it then? How was the soil formed? Learned men think that, at first, the surface of the earth was solid rock. How was this rock changed into workable soil? Occasionally, a curious boy picks up a rotten stone, squeezes it, and finds his hands filled with dirt, or soil. Now, just as the boy crumbled with his fingers this single stone, the great forces of nature, with boundless patience, crumbled, or, as it is called, disintegrated, the early rock mass. The simple but giant strong agents that beat the rocks into powder with a club-like force a million-fold more powerful than the club force of Hercules were chiefly 1. Heat and cold, 2. Water, frost, and ice, 3. A very low form of vegetable life, and 4. Tiny animals, if such minute bodies can be called animals. In some cases, these forces acted singly. In others, all acted together to rend and crumble the unbroken stretch of rock. Let us glance at some of the methods used by these skilled soil makers. Heat and cold are working partners. You already know that most hot bodies shrink, or contract, on cooling. The early rocks were hot. As the outside shell of rock cooled from the exposure to air and moisture, it contracted. This shrinkage of the rigid rim, of course, broke many of the rocks, and here and there left cracks, or fissures. In these fissures, water collected and froze. As freezing water expands with irresistible power, the expansion still further broke the rocks to pieces. The smaller pieces, again, in the same way, were acted on by frost and ice, and again crumbled. This process is still a means of soil formation. Running water was another giant soil former. If you would understand its action, observe some usually sparkling stream just after a washing rain. The clear waters are discolored by mud washed in from the surrounding hills. As though disliking their muddy burden, the waters strive to throw it off. Here, as low banks offer chance, they run out into shallows and drop some of it. Here, as they pass a quiet pool, they deposit more. At last they reach the still water at the mouth of the stream, and there they leave behind the last of their mud load, and often form of it little three-sided islands called deltas. In the same way, mighty rivers like the Amazon, the Mississippi, and the Hudson, when they are swollen by rain, bear great quantities of soil in their sweep to the seas. Some of the soil they scatter over the lowlands as they swirl seaward, 
the rest they deposit in deltas at their mouths. It is estimated that the Mississippi carries to the ocean each year enough soil to cover a square mile of surface to a depth of 268 feet. The early brooks and rivers, instead of bearing mud, ran oceanward either bearing ground stone that they themselves had worn from the rocks by ceaseless fretting, or bearing stones that other forces had already dislodged. The large pieces were whirled from side to side and beaten against one another, or against bedrock, until they were ground into smaller and smaller pieces. The rivers distributed this rock soil just as the later rivers distribute muddy soil. For ages, the moving waters ground against the rocks. Vast were the waters, vast the number of years, vast the results. Glaciers were another soil-producing agent. Glaciers are streams frozen and moving slowly but irresistibly onwards, down well-defined valleys, grinding and pulverizing the rock masses detached by the force and weight of their attack. Where and how were these glaciers formed? Once a great part of upper North America was a vast sheet of ice. Whatever moisture fell from the sky fell as snow. No one knows what made this long winter of snow, but we do know that snows piled on snows until mountains of white were built up. The lower snow was by the pressure of that above it packed into ice masses. By and by, some change of climate caused the masses of ice to break up somewhat and to move south and west. These moving masses, carrying rock and frozen earth, ground them to powder. King thus describes the stately movement of these snow mountains. Beneath the bottom of this slowly moving sheet of ice, which with more or less difficulty kept itself conformable with the face of the land over which it was riding, the sharper outstanding points were cut away and the deeper river canyons filled in. Desolate and rugged rocky wastes were thrown down and spread over with rich soil. The joint action of air, moisture, and frost was still another agent of soil making. This action is called weathering. Whenever you have noticed the outside stones of a spring house, you have noticed that tiny bits are crumbling from the face of the stones and adding little by little to the soil. This is a slow way of making additions to the soil. It is estimated that it would take 728,000 years to wear away limestone rock to a depth of 39 inches. But when you recall the countless years through which the weather has striven against the rocks, you can readily understand that its never-wearying activity has added immensely to the soil. In the rock soil formed in these various ways, and indeed on the rocks themselves, tiny plants that live on food taken from the air began to grow. They grew just as you now see mosses and lichens grow on the surface of rocks. The decay of these plants added some fertility to the newly formed soil. The life and death of each succeeding generation of these lowly plants added to the soil matter accumulating on the rocks. Slowly but unceasingly, the soil increased in depth until higher vegetation forms could flourish and add their dead bodies to it. This vegetable addition to the soil is generally known as hummus. In due course of time, low forms of animal life came to live on these plants, and in turn by their work and their death to aid in making a soil fit for the plowman. Thus, with a deliberation that fills man with awe, the powerful forces of nature splintered the rocks, crumbled them, filled them with plant food, and turned their flinty grains into a soft, snug home for vegetable life. Section 2. Tillage of the Soil A good many years ago, a man by the name of Jethro Tull lived in England. He was a farmer and a most successful man in every way. He first taught the English people and the world the value of thorough tillage of the soil. Before and during his time, farmers did not till the soil very intelligently. They simply prepared the seedbed in a careless manner, 
as a great many farmers do today, and when the crops were gathered, the yields were not large. Jethro Tull centered attention on the important fact that careful and thorough tillage increases the available plant food in the soil. He did not know why his crops were better when the ground was frequently and thoroughly tilled, but he knew that such tillage did increase his yield. He explained the fact by saying, Tillage is manure. We have since learned the reason for the truth that Tull taught, and while his explanation was incorrect, the practice that he was following was excellent. The stirring of the soil enables the air to circulate through it freely, and permits a breaking down of the compounds that contain the elements necessary to plant growth. You have seen how the air helps to crumble the stone and brick in old buildings. It does the same with soil if permitted to circulate freely through it. The agent of the air that chiefly performs this work is called carbonic acid gas, and this gas is one of the greatest helpers the farmer has in carrying on his work. We must not forget that in soil preparation the air is just as important as any of the tools and implements used in cultivation. If the soil is fertile and if deep plowing has always been done, good crops will result, other conditions being favorable. If, however, the tillage is poor, scanty harvests will always result. For most soils, a two-horse plow is necessary to break up and pulverize the land. A shallow soil can always be improved by properly deepening it. The principle of greatest importance in soil preparation is the gradual deepening of the soil in order that plant roots may have more comfortable homes. If the farmer has been accustomed to plow but four inches deep, he should adjust the plow so as to turn five inches at the next plowing, then six, and so on until the seed bed is nine or ten inches deep. This gradual deepening will not injure the soil, but will put it quickly in good condition. If to good tillage rotation of crops be added, the soil will become more fertile with each succeeding year. The plow, harrow, and roller are all necessary to good tillage and to a proper preparation of the seed bed. The soil must be made compact and clods of all sizes must be crushed. Then the air circulates freely and paying crops are the rule and not the exception. Tillage does these things. It increases the plant food supply, destroys weeds, and influences the moisture content of the soil. Exercise Question 1. What tools are used in tillage? Question 2. How should a poor and shallow soil be treated? Question 3. Why should a poor and shallow soil be well compacted before sowing the crop? Question 4. Explain the value of a circulation of air in the soil. Question 5. What causes iron to rust? Question 6. Why is a two-horse turning plow better than a one-horse plow? Question 7. Where will clods do the least harm, on top of the soil or below the surface? Question 8. Do plant roots penetrate clods? Question 9. Are earthworms a benefit or an injury to the soil? Question 10. Name three things that tillage does. Section 3. The Moisture of the Soil did anyone ever explain to you how important water is to the soil, or tell you why it is so important? Often, as you know, crops entirely fail because there is not enough water in the soil for the plants to drink. How necessary is it, then, that the soil be kept in the best possible condition to catch and hold enough water to carry the plant through dry, hot spells? Perhaps you are ready to ask, how does the mouthless plant drink its stored-up water? The plant gets all its water through its roots. You have seen the tiny thread-like roots of a plant spreading all about in fine soil. 
They are down in the ground, taking up plant food and water for the stalk and leaves above. The water, carrying plant food with it, rises in a simple but peculiar way through the roots and stems. The plants use the food for building new tissue, that is, for growth. The water passes out through the leaves into the air. When the summers are dry and hot and there is but little water in the soil, the leaves shrink up. This is simply a method they have of keeping the water from passing too rapidly off into the air. I am sure you have seen the corn blades all shriveled on very hot days. This shrinkage is nature's way of diminishing the current of water that is steadily passing through the plant. A thrifty farmer will try to keep his soil in such good condition that it will have a supply of water in it for growing crops when dry and hot weather comes. He can do this by deep plowing, by subsoiling, by adding any kind of decaying vegetable matter to the soil, and by growing crops that can be tilled frequently. The soil is a great storehouse for moisture. After the clouds have emptied their waters into the storehouse, the water of the soil comes to the surface where it is evaporated into the air. The water comes to the surface in just the same way that oil rises in a lamp wick. This rising of the water is called capillarity. It is necessary to understand what is meant by this big word. If into a pan of water you dip a glass tube, the water inside the tube rises above the level of the water in the pan. The smaller the tube, the higher will the water rise. The greater rise inside is perhaps due to the fact that the glass attracts the particles of water more than the particles of water attract one another. Now apply this principle to the soil. The soil particles have small spaces between them, and the spaces act just as the tube does. When the water at the surface is carried away by drying winds and warmth, the water deeper in the soil rises through the soil spaces. In this way, water is brought from its soil storehouse as plants need it. Of course, when the underground water reaches the surface, it evaporates. If we want to keep it for our crops, we must prepare a trap to hold it. Nature has shown us how this can be done. Pick up a plank as it lies on the ground. Under the plank, the soil is wet, while the soil not covered by the plank is dry. Why? Capillarity brought the water to the surface, and the plank, by keeping away wind and warmth, acted as a trap to hold the moisture. Now, of course, a farmer cannot set a trap of planks over his field, but he can make a trap of dry earth, and that will do just as well. When a crop like corn or cotton or potatoes is cultivated, the fine loose dirt stirred by the cultivating plow will make a mulch that serves to keep water in the soil in the same way that the plank kept moisture under it. The mulch also helps to absorb the rains and prevents the water from running off the surface. Frequent cultivation, then, is one of the best possible ways for saving moisture. Hence, the farmer who most frequently stirs his soil in the growing season, and especially in seasons of drought, reaps, other things being equal, a more abundant harvest than if tillage were neglected. Exercise Question 1. Why is the soil wet under a board or under straw? Question 2. Will a soil that is fine and compact produce better crops than one that is loose and cloddy? Why? Question 3. Since the water which a plant uses comes through the roots, can the morning dew afford any assistance? Question 4. Why are weeds objectionable in a growing crop? Question 5. Why does the farmer cultivate growing corn and cotton? Section 4. How the water rises in the soil. When the hot dry days of summer come, the soil depends upon the subsoil or undersoil for the moisture that it must furnish its growing plants. 
The water was stored in the soil during the fall, winter, and spring months when there was plenty of rain. If you dig down into the soil when everything is hot and dry, you will soon reach a cool, moist undersoil. The moisture increases as you dig deeper into the soil. Now the roots of plants go down into the soil for this moisture because they need the water to carry the plant food up into the stems and leaves. You can see how the water rises in the soil by performing a simple experiment. Experiment Take a lamp chimney and fill it with fine dry dirt. The dirt from a road or a field will do. Tie over the smaller end of the lamp chimney a piece of cloth or a pocket handkerchief and place this end in a shallow pan of water. If the soil in the lamp chimney is clay and well packed, the water will quickly rise to the top. By filling three or four lamp chimneys with as many different soils, the pupil will see that the water rises more slowly in some than in others. Now take the water pan away, and the water in the lamp chimneys will gradually evaporate. Study for a few days the effect of evaporation on the several soils. Section 5. Draining the Soil A wise man was once asked, What is the most valuable improvement ever made in agriculture? He answered, Drainage. Often soils unfit for crop production because they contain too much water are by drainage rendered the most valuable of farming lands. Drainage benefits the land in the following ways. 1. It deepens the subsoil by removing unnecessary water from the spaces between the soil particles. This admits air. Then the oxygen, which is in the air, by aiding decay, prepares plant food for vegetation. 2. It makes the surface soil, or topsoil, deeper. It stands to reason that the deeper the soil, the more plant food becomes available for plant use. 3. It improves the texture of the soil. Wet soil is sticky. Drainage makes the sticky soil crumble and fall apart. 4. It prevents washing. 5. It increases the porosity of soils and permits roots to go deeper into the soil for food and moisture. 6. It increases the warmth of the soil. 7. It permits earlier working in spring and after rains. 8. It favors the growth of germs, which change the unavailable nitrogen of the soil, into nitrates, that is, into the form of nitrogen most useful to plants. 9. It enables plants to resist drought better because the roots go into the ground deeper early in the season. A soil that is hard and wet will not grow good crops. The nitrogen gathering crops will store the greatest quantity of nitrogen in the soil when the soil is open to the free circulation of the air. These valuable crops cannot do this when the soil is wet and cold. Sandy soils with sandy subsoils do not often need drainage. Such soils are naturally drained. With clay soils, it is different. It is very important to remove the stagnant water in them and to let the air in. When land has been properly drained, the other steps in improvement are easily taken. After soil has been dried and mellowed by proper drainage, then commercial fertilizers, barnyard manure, cowpeas, and clover can most readily do their great work of improving the texture of the soil and of making it fitter for plant growth. Tile drains. Tile drains are the best and cheapest that can be used. It would not be too strong to say that draining by tiles is the most perfect drainage. Thousands of practical tests in this country have proved the superiority of tile draining for the following reasons. 1. Good tile drains properly laid last for years and do not fill up. 2. They furnish the cheapest possible means of removing too much water from the soil. 3. They are out of reach of all cultivating tools. 4. 
surface water in filtering through the tiles leaves its nutritious elements for plant growth experiments to show the effect of drainage take two tomato cans and fill both with the same kind of soil punch several holes in the bottom of one to drain the soil above and to admit air circulation leave the other unpunctured plant seeds of any kind in both cans and keep in a warm place add every third day equal quantities of water let seeds grow in both cans and observe the difference in growth for two or three weeks. To show the effect of air in soils, take two tomato cans, fill one with soil that is loose and warm, and the other with wet clay or muck from a swampy field. Plant a few seeds of the same kind in each and observe how much better the dry, warm, open soil is for growing farm crops. Section 6. Improving the Soil We hear a great deal about the exhaustion or wearing out of the soil. Many uncomfortable people are always declaring that our lands will no longer produce profitable crops, and hence that farming will no longer pay. Now, it is true, unfortunately, that much land has been robbed of its fertility, and because this is true, we should be most deeply interested in everything that leads to the improvement of our soils. When our country was first discovered and trees were growing everywhere, we had virgin soils, or new soils, that were rich and productive because they were filled with vegetable matter and plant food. There are not many virgin soils now because the trees have been cut from the best lands and these lands have been farmed so carelessly that the vegetable matter and available plant food have been largely used up. Now that fresh land is scarce, it is very necessary to restore fertility to these exhausted lands. What are some of the ways in which this can be done? There are several things to be done in trying to reclaim worn-out land. One of the first of these is to till the land well. Many of you may have heard the story of the dying father who called his sons about him and whispered feebly, There is great treasure hidden in the garden. The sons could hardly wait to bury their dead father before, thud, 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 their picks were going into the garden. Day after day they dug, they dug deep, they dug wide. Not a foot of the crop-worn garden escaped the probing of the pick as the sons feverishly searched for the expected treasure. But no treasure was found. Their work seemed entirely useless. Let us not lose every whit of our labor. Let us plant this pick's guard garden, said the eldest. So the garden was planted. In the fall, the hitherto neglected garden yielded a harvest so bountiful, so unexpected, that the meaning of their father's words dawned upon them. Truly, they said, a treasure was hidden here. Let us seek it in all our fields. The story applies as well today as it did when it was first told. Thorough culture of the soil, frequent and intelligent tillage, these are the foundations of soil restoration. Along with good tillage must go crop rotation and good drainage. A supply of organic matter will prevent heavy rains from washing the soil and carrying away plant food. Drainage will aid good tillage in allowing air to circulate between the soil particles and in arranging plant food so that plants can use it. But we must add hummus or vegetable matter to the soil. You remember that the virgin soils contained a great deal of vegetable matter and plant food, but by the continuous growing of plants like wheat, corn, and cotton, and by constant shallow tillage, both hummus and plant food have been used up. Consequently, much of our cultivated soil today is hard and dead. There are three ways of adding hummus and plant food to this lifeless land. The first way is to apply barnyard manure. To adopt this method means that livestock raising must be a part of all farming. The second way is to adopt rotation of crops, and frequently to plow under crops like clover and cowpeas. 
The third way is to apply commercial fertilizers. To summarize, if we want to make our soil better year by year, we must cultivate well, drain well, and in the most economical way, add hummus and plant food. Experiment. Select a small area of ground at your home and divide it into four sections as shown in the following sketch. On section A, apply barnyard manure. On section B, apply commercial fertilizers. On section C, apply nothing, but till well. On section D, apply nothing and till very poorly. A, B, and C should all be thoroughly plowed and harrowed. Then add barnyard manure to A, commercial fertilizers to B, and harrow A, B, and C at least four times until the soil is mellow and fine. D will most likely be cloddy, like many fields that we often see. Now plant on each plat some crop like cotton, corn, or wheat. When the plats are ready to harvest, measure the yield of each and determine whether the increased yield of the best plats has paid for the outlay for tillage and manure. The pupil will be much interested in the results obtained from the first crop. Now follow a system of crop rotation on the plats. Clover can follow corn or cotton or wheat, and cowpeas, wheat. Then determine the yield of each plat for the second crop. By following these plats for several years and increasing the number, the pupils will learn many things of greatest value. Section 7. Manuring the Soil In the early days of our history, when the soil was new and rich, we were not compelled to use large amounts of manures and fertilizers. Yet our histories speak of an Indian named Squanto who came into one of the New England colonies and showed the first settlers how, by putting a fish in each hill of corn, they could obtain larger yields. If people in those days, with new and fertile soils, could use manures profitably, how much more we ought to use them in our time, when soils have lost their virgin fertility, and when plant food in the soil has been exhausted by years and years of cropping. To sell year after year all the produce grown on land is a sure way to ruin it. If, for example, the richest land is planted every year in corn, and no stable or farmyard manure or other fertilizer return to the soil, the land so treated will of course soon become too poor to grow any crop. If, on the other hand, clover or alfalfa or corn or cottonseed meal is fed to stock, then the manure from the stock returned to the soil, the land will be kept rich. Hence, those farmers who do not sell such raw products as cotton, corn, wheat, oats, and clover, but who market articles made from these raw products, find it easier to keep their land fertile. For illustration, if instead of selling hay, farmers feed it to sheep and sell meat and wool. If instead of selling cotton seed, they feed its meal to cows and sell milk and butter. If instead of selling stover, they feed it to beef cattle, they get a good price for products and in addition have all the manure needed to keep their land productive and increase its value each year. If we wish to keep up the fertility of our lands, we should not allow anything to be lost from our farms. All the manures, straw, roots, stubble, healthy vines, in fact everything decomposable, should be plowed under or used as a top dressing. A special care should be taken in storing manure. It should be watchfully protected from sun and rain. If a farmer has no shed under which to keep his manure, he should scatter it on his fields as fast as it is made. He should understand also that liquid manure is of more value than solid, because the more important plant food, nitrogen, is found almost wholly in the liquid portion. Some of the phosphoric acid and considerable amounts of the potash are also found in the liquid manure. Hence. 
Economy requires that none of this escape either by leakage or by fermentation. Sometimes one can detect the smell of ammonia in the stable. This ammonia is formed by the decomposition of the liquid manure, and its loss should be checked by sprinkling some floats, acid phosphate, or muck over the stable floor. Many farmers find it desirable to buy fertilizers to use with the manure made on the farm. In this case, it is helpful to understand the composition, source, and availability of the various substances composing commercial fertilizers. The three most valuable things in commercial fertilizers are nitrogen, potash, and phosphoric acid. The nitrogen is obtained from 1. Nitrate of soda mined in Chile, 2. Ammonium sulfate, a byproduct of the gas works, 3. Dried blood and other byproducts of the slaughterhouses, and 4. Cotton seed meal. Nitrate of soda is soluble in water and may therefore be washed away before being used by plants. For this reason, it should be applied in small quantities and at intervals of a few weeks. Potash is obtained in Germany, where it is found in several forms. It is put on the market as muriate of potash, sulfate of potash, kainite, which contains salt as an impurity, and in other impure forms. Potash is found also in wood ashes. Phosphoric acid is found in various rocks of Tennessee, Florida, and South Carolina, and also to a large extent in bones. The rocks or bones are usually treated with sulfuric acid. This treatment changes the phosphoric acid into a form ready for plant use. These three kinds of plant food are ordinarily all that we need to supply. In some cases, however, lime has to be added. Besides being a plant food itself, lime helps most soils by improving the structure of the grains, by sweetening the soil, thereby aiding the little living germs called bacteria, by hastening the decay of organic matter, and by setting free the potash that is locked up in the soil. End of chapter 1